Hello, and welcome to Operation MBA, Taranto's Big Picture. Now, first things first, for those who are wanting a bit of a blooper reel, please watch right to the end, because at the end I have some of the excerpts of an earlier attempt at recording this video, when the fluffy research assistant decided that, frankly, I had better things to do than record the video, mainly spend the time patting him. Now, what is it about MB8 that we should learn? Well, for starters, we should learn that sometimes the most important piece of history is the least important, uh, to our perception, is one of the least important sections of what is going on. Operation MB8 takes place a little over five months after the Italians have entered the war. They don't join World War II till the 10th of June, 1940. So, frankly, up until that point, the Mediterranean had been a secondary theatre. And this is a good thing. It had been a secondary theatre. It had been a theatre where there wasn't anything going on. Well, they worry about the Italians, but there wasn't actually anything, any fighting actually happening at that point. So, why worry too much? Why? You didn't need to. The Royal Navy didn't need to. The... Royal Navy could afford to move uh, ships and etc. from the Mediterranean to the home fleet. A tribal flotilla goes the whole way down the Mediterranean. No fuss. Comes from, uh, starts off the war operating in the Red Sea and around the Horn of Africa area. Basically because they can't deploy any more cruisers through there because they're worried about the Italians entering the war. But they want to have forces there to deal with the Italians if they do enter the war. So they start off there. When nothing happens... Mm, they come back and are withdrawn and take part in the Norway campaign. And then Italy ends the war and whoosh, stuff gets, starts getting shuttled through. And actually, MB8 is part of the shuttling. MB8, the big thing for MB8 in its long term impact for the war, really, two and once uh, as it was intended. The attack on Toronto is wonderful from long term impact for the war, from other reasons, but the intended impact of MB8 was the passing of a battleship, cruisers, and destroyers from the Western Mediterranean to the Eastern Mediterranean. That is the thing. All the rest is cover for that. And in fact, there's a whole slew of convoys and other actions going on as part of the MB8 to provide cover for each other, to mutually distract and disconcert and undermine the Italian leadership and the Italian command and control. Now, before we get into everything, I would like to add that if you do like these videos, please subscribe, because this. When I put this up on the Spreadshirt.com, and I set that up because people ask me for merchandise, my aunt saw this, and she said that if I get to 13,000 subscribers by December 31st, 2021, she and her my uncle will wear Blackburn, Blackburn face masks and take a photo of themselves doing it. So familial bragging rights, and I get a picture which could be, well, is going to be displayed online, but is also going to be uh, going to be potential familial blackmail material for years. Please. Anyway, so what do we have going on? Well, as you can see, Operation Judgment is right at the end, and that's the attack on Toronto, and also Battle of the Toronto Strait. The, the Royal Navy are not happy with just attacking the harbour, which is the main base and a critical facility for the Italians and doing damage to their battleships. No, no, no. They also have to send a force of cruisers and tribal class destroyers into pretty much the Adriatic and take out a convoy just to show the Italians that they can do it. This did of course, have an impact on the Italians. It could have had an even greater impact than it did, but we'll talk about that at the end. So it starts off with Convoy in 6 which is one of the main convoys going through, and that's resupplying Greece, but also looking at some troops going to Crete. Then we have Convoy MW3, which is merchant vessels coming from... Um, doing a sort of a run and getting through uh, from Alexandria to Malta. 
We have Operation Cope, which is the reinforcement of Malta. The, also the reinforcement of the Mediterranean fleet. The force which is carried across the way by Force H. We have Operation Crack, which is HMS Ark Royal going and having a crack at the Italians and also successfully distracting them. We have Convoy ME3, which are merchant vessels uh, sailing from Malta back to Alexandria, escorted by Ramillies, Coventry, and two destroyers. And we have, of course, Operation Judgment. One of the critical assets of this operation, Barham. This is about moving stuff around the world. And this, the thing is, I have got a rough list here of the ships involved from the Commonwealth forces, as I'm, I tend to call them, rather than the Allied forces. There are Allied forces which are involved at various points, but this is very much a Commonwealth force. There aren't Greek ships taking part in this action. There aren't the Polish turning up. There aren't the Dutch. Uh, they turn up at different points during the war, but they're not involved in this operation. It's a very much a Commonwealth force. So in which case that does sort of help the royal planning in many ways, because there's a lot of commonality and a lot of the officers have experience of these operations from interwar training. You have Ark Royal and Lustrous actually take part, but of course you also have Eagle there. Unfortunately, she's got a damaged aviation fuel system, so she doesn't take any part, but she could have been quite a big factor in play. Then we have the five battleships, Barum, Ramillies, Malaya, Valiant, and Warspite. Well, that's four Queen Elizabeth class <whistles> and an R class. The R class doing the escort role and proving very useful at that. We'll be talking about that as we go on. HMS Terror, Monitor, uh, two heavy cruisers, Berwick and York, uh, seven or eight light cruisers. Now, I'm fairly sure there are eight light cruisers involved, and I'm fairly sure the eighth one is HMS Dispatch. It's the only one which fits the, the outline given and the operation given and actually where it is at the time. But in all the accounts you can read of the various operations, this, uh, there's a light cruiser which never really gets named. And it's on the official list of the ships being, uh, being around and involved in those operations. But the accounts, you... It just doesn't get, it, it doesn't feature in any of the high profile ones where they list out the ships and they go to full details. It's basically acting as one of the convoy escorts. And then we have Glasgow, Gloucester, Orion, Sheffield, and Sydney. So we have quite a lot of, sometimes, we have very modern cruisers. You have an AA class, AA version of a C class cruiser, yes, and you have dispatch. But other than that, this is a very modern group of light cruisers. We then have 30 odd destroyers, which includes the scrap iron flotilla, which are at the end here, and I should have a list of them as listed. We have eight destroyer flotilla, we have some tribals, we have a lot of scratch flotillas being formed. Because of the water, because putting it together, this is what's happened. We also have Hasty, Havelock, Herod, Hotspur, and Hepiron. Yes, the H class. The ones that survived in Narvik and some of the ones who weren't there at Narvik. That's the second battle. So, what have we got going on? Well, this beauty is, of course, operating from Alexandria. That's where she's coming from. Force H, that's Ark Royals. Bandwagon, that's Ark Royals, you know, operational duties. But the moment you see this side coming in, well, that's illustrious. It can be illustrious and Eagle. And Eagle takes a lot of part in other operations. Unfortunately, and I'll get into this at the end, Eagle is out of the count because of damage she receives earlier on in October, which is only discovered on the 5th of November. So it's discovered 81 years ago on Friday this week. Life happens. And that's what rules her out of taking part in the operation. 
and another man. This one taken from Armored Carrier's website. Gives you more details, but less of the expanse of the Mediterranean. And it really shows you how much of the fighting and how much of the operations are concentrated in the Ionian Sea, the Adriatic, and the Western Mediterranean. Because this is the critical area. This is the area which is where Italian supplies are coming in. This is Malta, this is Sicily, this is Sardinia, this is, of course, Taranto. This is where these forces are involved and where the convoys are traveling backwards and forwards in the various convoy routes and where the Royal Navy is really having to dominate. Now, they have advantages at this point because... The air power, which you will see become an increasing feature of the Mediterranean campaigns from 1941, 1942, and 1943, isn't yet in extant. It isn't there. And there is, it's there in nascent points. There is the Italian air power there, but it's nowhere near the, even the operational integration it will, receive, it will achieve with the Navy later in the war. They are still very much in the massively overly feuding part, let alone the mildly cooperating occasionally on the on a um, a day which has a uh, V in it, <sighs> or maybe a W. The army, of course, the Italian army has, of course, invaded Greece at this point, and the Royal Navy has expected the Italian Navy to sortie to support it. But it hasn't. It's had operations out with HMS Eagle and Illustrious together with the fleet out hunting, waiting for the Italian army, to, uh, Italian navy to come out to support the Italian army. Uh, Cunningham and Lister have both been quite disappointed that the Italians haven't come out. It's despite the fact the Italians on paper could mount a far more significant battle group than he could. If we go back to earlier, to the fleet list, if we think about it, they're getting five battleships because Barham is being passed over. Up until this point, he has four to the Italian six. And yes, his battleships are all 15-inch guns, but, well, the Italians have been far more upgraded. In comparison to the British all the ships. So. They are trying their best. And they are achieving quite a lot. But there are limits to what they can achieve. And Barham coming and joining the fleet is part of their of them trying to boost their capabilities. Also, you have to remember at this point, Vittorio no, Andre Doria is not back yet in service, and some of the other Italian battleships are being worked up. So, aiming for four or five, it's not the greatest odds. And as said, the Italians have been better upgraded, but they are all 15-inch gun ships, and they are all working. So. They have been fairly confident in hunting the Italians. And of course, they have two aircraft carriers. But no, this operation comes about because they need to pass more reinforcements to the Mediterranean fleet. And they don't want the Italians to interfere with that. And they also want to try and reduce their odds. They want to try and stop the Italians operating from Toronto. But because Taranto is quite weak in terms of the British assessment of its defences, and seeing how well they get in and get out, you can sort of understand that their, uh, their perspective was not perhaps that wrong. They also don't want to throw away any attack. They want to actually score a decent probability of kills. The two important officers we have to think of about for this are Cunningham and Lister. Now, when Lister had been captain of HMS Glorious, when she'd been serving the Mediterranean fleet, he'd actually been part of a group that had come up with the original plan to attack Toronto. This was while Admiral Pound was the CNC Mediterranean. 
Cunningham had been also out there at that time. And this is one of the reasons you have advantages of the Royal Navy systems. One of the advantages you have of the Royal, Navy, the Royal Navy's uh, training system, where officers go out to certain stations and then they come home to other stations. So, your home station will either be the Mediterranean or the, Atl or the home fleet, Atlantic, whatever it's called at that time. And then you might have another area you go out and deploy to. You might deploy to the Far East, you might deploy to South America. This is how, of course, you produce experts like Commodore Harwood, who really knows the South, uh, South Atlantic and South America stations backwards and forwards because he's been there so many times. How you produce the experts like Noble, etc. in the Far East. But you need to have a synthesization pot where you can have information exchanged and where you can uh, work on the wider fleet. And this is what the Mediterranean and the home fleet have often been used as. So the officers would be deployed and then come back and do their ne next service. And so this builds up Officers who are experts in the Mediterranean and also in another area, or experts in the Atlantic and in another area, and so they all have experience. And they also have experience of operating together. Because they might work with some people in their distance station and others in the home or the Atlantic uh, home or Mediterranean. It's about building a cohesive force. And it's very much the RN's attempt to try and get round its global dilemma. It's a problem of having to be strong and knowledgeable everywhere. Not everyone can be strong and knowledgeable everywhere. The Royal Navy can't be strong everywhere, and its people won't be, no, uh, won't be knowledgeable everywhere. But if you have people who, are not, uh, people who are knowledgeable in certain areas, and you have mixed crews of these people with, the, with their, their areas of knowledge, then you usually have at least one or two, if not more, people who actually have local knowledge on a ship. And this is especially important once you get to executive officers when they're discussing and working out operations and supporting admirals in staffs. So as you can see, there is a reason why the battles take place where they do. Algeria is, of course, mostly under control of Vichy France. And yes, the Vichy are an interesting case in that they aren't allies anymore because they... Mm, Surrender, one of a better phrase. But they're also not technically fighting the British. But the British don't trust them and are fairly sure their reconnaissance information is going back to Germany, if not to Italy. You can see the Italian bases are mainly down the centre. And then you have the British bases, which are mostly, mostly, in the eastern Mediterranean to defend the Suez Canal in Egypt, with Gibraltar being the significant asset in the Western Mediterranean. And Malta sitting there in the middle. So, let's consider our first part of this operation, Convoy AN6. A slow convoy, uh, it's escorted by a trawler, which I'm still not quite sure which one of the slow trawlers it was that was chosen. There are a few options, and frankly, It's an iffy one, because there are several trawlers going backwards and forwards anyway, so the usual trick you can use for finding out ship names and working out is asking which one's here on which date and which one's here on the other date. And in this case, it's escorted. They are escorted, but about three trawlers arrive in the same place on the same date. Anyway... But it's technically only escorted by one. But again, rather like this scenario, they have Force B, who are described as shaping a similar course. Basically, there are two light cruisers which are loaded with their own reinforcements heading for Crete, which mimic the course of the slow tankers, but don't actually escort them technically, but they're not that far away, so that's a problem a message would go up and cruisers would come running. And there's actually a third cruiser, which is Force, uh, which is designated Force C, which is Orion, which is Admiral Henry Prindon Whipples, Vice Admiral Henry Prindon Whipples, pictured um, flagship. And that's transporting RAF supplies to Greece and is also going on inspection of Suda Bay. And all three were uh, cruisers, that's Force C and Force B, uh, Force B will join, uh, rejoin to form Force X along with a couple of destroyers 
which come from what is at this point for say to do a raid on the Otranto Strait. Yes, there is a complex mismatch of operations. And of course, in that is HMS Sydney. Now, Sydney is one of those ships which is most famous for what is possibly her least... Well, she's most famous for being lost, uh, by, uh, sunk by the Cormoran and sinking the Cormoran. But she shouldn't be. She should be famous for all the actions she takes part in the Mediterranean. She is one of the most successful examples of the Royal Navy's cruiser policy in World War II, especially in the beginning period, where the Royal Navy has pursued a policy of building smaller but more numerous cruisers. So they'll always have enough. Because whereas Japan can afford to focus on the larger cruisers, which always looks good on paper, but Japan can afford to do that because they're expecting the enemy to come to them. They're not fighting across the world, they're just fighting in their portion of the Pacific and the enemy's coming to them. So they can afford to be fewer numbers and cruisers and stronger because they can probably uh, stronger individual cruisers. Whereas the Royal Navy has to be everywhere. And a single cruiser, one is none. You need at least three, four, five, six to cover an area properly. Or at least as properly as you can do. That means on tonnage limitations, such as the treaties put in, you're always stuck with a case of, do we build the cruisers the same size as their opponents? And so they can match them one-on-one, -on -one, but we won't have enough to do the job. Or do we build enough cruisers to do the job, but they won't be one-on-one -on -one matches to our opponents? The Royal Navy ends up trying to straddle that line quite a bit the whole way through World War II. And you can honestly say the town class and the Dido's are pretty much the Royal Navy going, we can't do this. We're going to have to do one which is built for numbers and one which is built to be big enough. <sighs> Life is fun and complicated. Then we have Convoy MW3. Made up of three empty merchant vessels bound from Malta. Bound for Malta from Alexandra. They're accompanied part of the way by one of the scrap iron flotilla and Terra picture. Those two vessels were bound for Suda Bay and Crete. They were escorted the whole way by Coventry and three destroyers. Also from the scrap iron flotilla, I think. It was left Alexandria on the 4th of November, travelled 11 and a half knots, and reached Malta on the 10th of November. So why is this? Why is this convoy of empty merchant vessels going from Malta to, uh, uh, Malta to Alexandria? Uh, going from Alexandria to Malta, sorry. Provides cover. Why is the Royal Navy's fleet at sea? Well, if any spies are talking about it, merchant vessels have left. They're at sea to cover the convoys. That's why the Royal Navy's at sea. And of course, this mentions the Scrap Iron Flotilla. They are the, the Australian destroyers, and just as valuable as Sydney. Although they are World War One era destroyers, they were bought by the Australian government, from the British government, obviously. And they're given the nickname Scrap Iron Flotilla by Goebbels, who's so derisive of them when they arrive. But they prove invaluable. They are very capable little vessels. They are capable of anti-submarine warfare. They're good at escorting ships. They can provide AA fire. They're not as modern. They're not as big as a tribal class or a Fletcher class or something like that. No. But they are still useful assets. And in fact, that's going to be a theme of MB8. MB8. A lot of useful assets are used for various parts of the operation. Operation Coat. 
Well, this is the reinforcement convoy from Britain to Malta. So, they're carrying troops and anti-aircraft guns. Convoy is made up of Force B, uh, Force F, um, Barham, Berwick, and Glasgow, escorted by Encounter, Gallant, Grip, the Greyhound, and Griffin. They're also covered by Force H, which is Ark Royal and Sheffield, along with some destroyers, Duncan, Faulkner, Fire Drake, Forrester, Fortune, and Fury. Eight destroyer floated up. Three of Force H's destroyers would remain with the Force. Um, to escort them into straight up past Malta, and then they turned back. But Ark Royal and Sheffield turned back at 165 nautical miles from Sicily. Pretty much the RN didn't want them going straight in. And interesting enough, HMS Renown isn't part of this operation. It could have been interesting if she was. She does take part in operations quite soon afterwards, including Operation White, which is another reinforcement from Malta and various other things, but She's not there. She's not part of this Operation Coat. If she had been, there is a question in my mind as to whether or not Ark Royal might have been used for other things, but she wasn't. One of the most important vessels to be passed across from the western to eastern Mediterranean is HMS Berwick. She's a Kent class county cruiser. She's got eight eight-inch guns in four twin turrets, eight four-inch guns in anti-aircraft mounts, uh, 16 two-pounder, that's 40 millimeter, pom-poms in two octuple mounts, and 8.5-inch machine guns in two quadruple mounts. Yes, this was the time when they still felt the 0.5-inch was worth fitting. And, well, she has between one and four inches of armor pr uh, box protection over the magazines. So basically, you take your magazine and you go, right, where am I most likely to have the magazine hit from? What angles? Above. Sides, it has to get through the belt, but I still probably want protection there. Underneath. We'd hope not, but that would be a, a torpedo going off underneath. So, you know, it goes from... Four inches over the most at-risk areas to one inch over the least at-risk area. 1.375 inches of deck armor. One inch of side plating. Turrets and on the, and turrets and on the bulkheads as well. Uh, they have a four and a half inch belt, armor belt. Plus... Um, plus four inch thick internal boiler room sides that were added between 1936 and 1940. Which is quite a hefty addition of armour if you think about it. Especially as officially they just decided to do it in 1936 and 1940 and they just happened to have plates exactly matching fitted that they could quickly install in the vast majority of the county class cruisers. But of course, the Royal Navy was far more honest than all the other navies when it came to the treaties. Just a far more honest, didn't they? They never disobeyed them. Anyway. Operation Crack? Well, this is an interesting one. Basically, the Royal Navy didn't want the Italians to realise that judgement was coming. And they knew the Italians would focus in on Ark Royal. They always did. Ark Royal was the big, impressive strike carrier of the Royal Navy, the one with the largest air group. And honestly, if she had been used for the attack on Toronto, the damage would have been immense. As it was, she uses roughly 36 aircraft from 810, 18, and 818, and 820 squadrons to attack various targets up Elmas and Cagliari, Cagliari on the Italian, uh, uh, the island of Sardinia on the south coast. So basically, they're lulling the Italians into a false sense of security because the Royal Navy, Arc Royals, off attacking 
Sardinia. And if we go back, <coughs> the south coast of Sardinia. She does this on the way past while doing uh, supporting other operations. But the critical thing is, it makes the Italians start to concentrate on the western, uh, start to concentrate on the western Mediterranean. They're starting to shape their reconnaissance aircraft, their movements around what's going on in the western Mediterranean because this force is moving. They damage seaplanes, they damage aircraft, some aircraft and some hangars. They cause lots of damage to Italian reconnaissance assets, but most importantly, they draw a lot of attention to them. And that's what Ark Royal is principally doing. Now, honestly, Ark Royal, it would have probably been the best asset to use for Operation Judgment, for attacking Toronto. She is by far and away the best strike carrier the Royal Navy has in service at this time. She can carry the most aircraft. She can uh, launch the strike group the most, uh, most quickly. And she's also pretty much one of the quicker ones. So, this is what should have been used. If you're reading off paper and making decision based on what asset is best to do it. However, because of those things, she also serves as the best distraction. Because the Italians can read the same bits of paper we all can today. And the Italians had their own estimates based on Arc Royal, and the Germans had their own estimates based on Arc Royal. And therefore, where Arc Royal was, was where they thought there was going to be an attack. So, if Arc Royal is hanging around in the Western Mediterranean, and causing trouble there, and doing things there, then, as far as the Italians are concerned, they're fine in Taranto, because that's in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Ionian Sea. And really, they shouldn't have felt they were fine because, well, if you can, e e Eagle and Illustrious together could have mounted a significant air group. And they didn't know Eagle wasn't operational because of her fuel lines being damaged. So, then, but the thing is, as with many totems, people get focused on them. If we consider the modern example, and I'm only using this as an example. If we look at the current debates that keep going on about aircraft carriers and what's a good aircraft and carrier and what's a bad aircraft carrier and what we should the nations should have, many nations and many commentators keep focusing in on the Nimitz class or the Jarabar 4 class and going, oh, these are the ultimate ships. And that's true, they are some of the best carriers available at the moment. But because of that, if you were doing an operation with them someplace, then an opponent might well focus on that operation and ignore a very viable aircraft carrier, a HMS Queen Elizabeth or a Prince of HMS Prince of Wales, coming out operating in another space because they're the less capable Vistal strike carriers. They're, they definitely won't be used for a primary attack. You can see how someone can convince themselves of this because it's logical. And it's also another reason why you build carriers which are more capable if you're an ally than you maybe are usually going to run them with, because then you can fit more aircraft if you need, because, well, let's put it this way. It's easier to have a bigger carrier and run it light and be able to expand it is, than to have a small carrier and suddenly find you can't expand it if you need to have an operation which needs it. Anyway, good example of this, of the, of the utility of other assets, though, again, is use of Ramleys here. Okay, Convoy ME3 comprised of four merchant vessels sailing in ballast from Malta to Alexandria. Okay, there were some empty merchant vessels sailing to Malta, and these are some empty ones sailing back from Malta. Further cover. They were escorted by Ramleys, Coventry, and two destroyers. They sailed from Malta on the 10th of November and arrived in Alexandria on the 13th of November. Coventry and the two destroyers had, of course, escorted that force out there with terror and another, dest another destroyer. Coventry and Ramleys are both examples of using older ships to fill in roles so you don't have to do new build. 
it's one of the resp classic responses when people start bringing up it, Japanese or Italian heavy cruiser construction. And what would happen if World War II hadn't happened when it happened and if they would kept building those cruisers? One of my responses is always, well, the Royal Navy might not start building new super heavy cruisers themselves. They might concentrate on churning out the cruiser numbers they need because as long as they've got the R-Class in service, what are those heavy cruisers going to be used for? Are they going to be, uh, if you go and attack a convoy, you could find an R-Class sitting there. And the R-Class battleship is going to win a fight with a cruiser. No matter, unless it's a, no matter how big it is. So you don't need to do that. You can save the shipyard space for other things until you have to. It's the same with the C-Class and converting them to AA cruisers. Yes, in a world where you had infinite resources, you would probably just build more Didos and replace them with Didos. But when you don't have infinite resources and you have to make decisions as to what you're building, being able to upgrade a C-Class, which is a perfectly serviceable hull, into a perfectly serviceable anti-aircraft cruiser makes a lot of sense because that provides you with the increased number of AA cruisers and it means you don't have to use the shipyards for building more Didos. So you can build other things. Anything more useful than a Dido. Okay, yes, the Didos are useful, and they are. They are perfectly good ships. So just, I just wish they'd been a little bit longer and a little bit beamier, because that would have made them so much more useful post-Second World War. As it was, they are very good war-build ships, but I am going to reiterate my point that Tribal-class destroyers are destroyers built in a cruiser, a cruiser mold. Dido class cruisers are cruisers built in a destroyer mold, in that every square inch is shut full, and so it's got no room for really for expansion. So let's consider Operation Judgment itself. That's the 11th and 12th of November, and that's the attack on Toronto. So unfortunately, on the 21st of October, there had been a fire in an auxiliary fuel tank of one of the swordfish. This fire a 60 Imperial Gallon Auxiliary Tank. Um, the one that's usually stuck in the middle in the observer's seat, and they move back into the telegraphist air gunner's seat, had caught fire. And this had taken out a couple of other aircraft and had turned into something which had caused trouble, but had been contained, been sorted out, and Illustrious was back in service. Eagle had then suffered a breakdown in her fuel system, as we discussed. And so Illustrious took aboard five Eagle Swordfish. The British Task Force is commanded by Rear Admiral Lister, and it is comprised of Illustrious, Berwick, York, Glasgow, and Gloucester, escorted by Hasty, Havoc, Hyperion, and Ilex. So that's two heavy cruisers, two town class light cruisers. Four decentish destroyers and an air carrier. That's not really a group most people want to, uh, want to tag along to. 24 aircraft are drawn from four different squadrons. 813, 815, 819, and 824. Illustrious also had Fairy Fulmars aboard and Sea Gladiators aboard. Uh, the couple of Sea Gladiators are drawn from Eagle. Half of the Swordfish are armed with Torpedoes to serve as attack aircraft. And half are armed with bombs and flares. And the reason they have that, the reason they have bombs and flares fitted is because the flares are going to be used to both illuminate the harbour and distract the AA gunners, while the bombs will be, uh, bombers will be going into bomb targets to again try and distract the AA gunners. Everything's to try and get the torpedoes in. So this means ultimately you will have, well, you were supposed to have 11 torpedo bombers because it's, mm, in the end, they, they take 24 machines, but only 21 get airborne. And so they have eight, uh, they have six and five launch and two flights. One of the torpedo bombers from the second flight has to turn back, so they only launch 10 torpedoes. So out of the 21 aircraft that are launched, 11 
the torpedo bomb, our own torpedo bombs configuration. Ten were carrying bombs, our old bombs and flares. That's what you do to get in. So when you're talking about today and again, modern strikes, we will go, these aircraft are all going to be for a strike. It's probably not. Good lesson from history is that so you're going to have to have air, you're, some of your air attack group detailed off for suppression of enemy air defenses, for distraction, for other operations. And this means you don't get to attack with your full force. So you cannot look at your number and go, I have X number of aircraft and I'm going to launch an attack with them. Because maintenance and the other duties they have and the realities of actually conducting the operation often reduce X down to Y. So when you're thinking about the attack on Toronto and all it achieves, think about it this way. If that's achieved with 10 torpedo bombers. Yes, there are 21 aircraft involved in the strike, but it's 10 torpedo bombs. This is HMS Illustrious. And you can automatically see why I said earlier she is not as good a primary strike as, as Ark Royal. That's not because that's not her job. Remember, Ark Royal is a strike carrier. She's supposed to be sit back from the fleet and launch the big punch if she needs to be on the British Doctrine or attack the fleet in harbour. And we, that, that's what she's there for. The Illustrious is an armoured carrier. Well, technically an armoured hangar carrier. And her role, quite appropriately, is to sit with the fleet to provide air defense and a constant flow of strikes attacking enemy ships and supporting the battle fleet. When her sister almost gets involved in Matapan, good old HMS Formidable, that's not unsurprising because that's in many ways the psychology which has been engendered into these ships. Even at that point in the war. They are very, very potent carriers, but they are designed around the British philosophy of war. And the British philosophy of war is based on, they all could be operating in the Mediterranean and they could be operating in the Far East. And the Far East, they'll be outside the world from their infrastructure network. So they don't want to take, they want to minimize their casualties. And in the Mediterranean, they aren't going to be able to get away from their attacks. So they want to minimize their casualties. Really, Ark Royal shouldn't have been in their training. That's how short of carriers they were. Another classic point to point, uh, thing to point out is if Courageous and Glorious hadn't been lost when they were, the odds are at least one, if not two, would be in the Mediterranean somewhere. You might well have had Eagle in a different area. You might well have had Courageous and Glorious in the Mediterranean with one of them taking primary in the Western Mediterranean, the Western Mediterranean so allow Ark Royal to focus on the Atlantic duties of Force H and one joining illustrious in the eastern Mediterranean. And then you have the Battle of the Straits of Otranto. So, on the Italian side, you have all merchant vessels, all are sunk. You have the auxiliary cruiser, Ram Free, which thus survives and still survives to this day. And you have the torpedo boat, Fabrini. Technically, all the, the whole force is under the command of Captain Francisco D'Angelis. Angelis. And then on the Commonwealth side, and I'm sorry I've not tapped them in, I should have done. You have Sydney, Ajax and Orion, and Nubian and Mohawk. Mohawk is, of course, pictured. She's pretty. And she's pictured at the time when she's taking part in the Spanish Civil War patrols. You can tell because of the markings painted on B turret, uh, B mount. And basically, what happens is whilst the attack is going in at Taranto, or the Operation Judgment attack is going in, this force, Force X, of three light cruisers, two Traveller class destroyers, is going up into the Adriatic and it goes up as far as it can and then it, it's trying to hunt and find targets because this is the point. The Royal Navy is not only confusing the, uh, the Italians, they are not only attacking the Italians in their home to stop them coming out operating from that base because that base is particularly problematic if they operate from it. They are also 
trying to make them feel scared and afraid of what the Royal Navy will do. The Royal Navy is trying to achieve a level of psychological dominance over the Italians. They do quite well. They really do. And of course, HMS Nubian here is crucial to that. She'll be one of the most decorated ships of World War II. And if you had destroyers given battle honours in the same way as, as battleships and battle honours, she'd possibly be beat HMS Warspite. As it is, she ranks in with the three which are just below Warspite. She does all her work in one war, whereas Warspite does hers thanks to World War One and World War Two. She'll even go out and join the Eastern Fleet and take, uh, take part with the 21st... Um, Ron, uh, Ron Navy's 21st Ro uh, Aircraft Carrier Squadron. So, the lesson from history is that uh, sometimes the best tool for the mission is the second best tool for the mission. But that is the point of all this operation. The Royal Navy are doing all these convoys and all these things to get supplies of ships to the Eastern Mediterranean, to get supplies of equipment to Malta to get supplies of equipment to Greece and to Crete. And at the same time, they want to launch a strike on the Italian Navy and try and push them back and push their operating sphere back to further secure Greece and further secure operations in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, the best vessel to do that with in the strike is, is Ark Royal. She could well have been carrying up to 48. Well, if she's fully loaded, she could be carrying 48 swordfish, uh, 24 skewers. Or any combination up to 72 aircraft quite easily. Think about what was achieved at Taranto, as said, with 10 torpedo bombers. 20 aircraft out of... 21 launched actually hit. Imagine what could have been achieved with, let's say, a squadron of skewers and three squadrons of swordfish, so 48 aircraft. That's not her even her using her full complement. Or a squadron of skewers and four squadrons of swordfish. It would have been a far, far greater loss. Right. So what we have this week, we have. This is an out-of-date one. Oh, where did I get this one from? I'm putting this. This is because I started putting this together a while back. But it's the fifth of November. Trafalgar to Dreadnought, a century and fifteen ships and battles. Because on the fourth of November, I'm helping someone move. And. It's on the 11th of November, it is the anniversary of the Battle of Taranto, and the vote for patrons 36 and 37 sh should be up and running? Possibly. I'm now forgotten, but I'll... Anyway, we've got Sherman's March to the Sea on the 16th of November as a long patrol. Um... We have got the 23rd of November, the sinking of HMS Royal Appendix. And the 30th of November, we have the Battle of Trans uh, Tassafogania. Otherwise known as the Fourth Battle of uh, Sapo Island. And the 9th of November, I'm still deciding. Because I was originally going to be doing something about the Royal Navy's monitors, but that hasn't... Um, come about yet because I haven't managed to get down to Portsmouth so we'll see we'll see I, I, I've got a couple of ideas and I know the Battle of My Man is going to be coming up soon right now first bonus HMS Eagle air group in 1940 between 18 and 24 swordfish and roughly 7 sea gladiators so why she doesn't she take part in Operation Judgment well whilst covering another convoy to Malta on 12th October She's damaged by near misses from SM-79s based in Sicily. Yes, Italian aircraft can get very nasty. 
the damage to the aviation fuel system is not immediately apparent. And she covers another convoy later that month. So basically, it's the 12th of October she's damaged, but it's not noticed and really discovered till the 5th of November. And she's back in service and operational by about the 16th of November. So 11 or 12 days is what you need to repair it. She actually does another convoy and does it successfully on the 27th of October. So it's the Royal Navy being paranoid and not wish, you know, risk, wishing to lose a carrier, which is why it's when it's discovered on the 5th, she doesn't take part. But if it had been discover, uh, discovered by operations or things in preparation before the 27th of October, let's say on the 25th of October rather than the 5th of November, she could well have been in service by the time of the attack of uh, Taranto. As it was, her aircraft are disembarked. And that's actually a big problem with losing an Eagle. Eagle's air group is one of the most worked up air groups the Royal Navy has at this point. They are such a committed air group, they went and found some sea gladiators to give themselves some air defense. They were originally all sawfish. And they found places to fit them. And some of her sea gladiators end up on Illustrious to give her extra air cover during the operation. And again, I'll remind you, if you did like the videos, please do like, please subscribe, because of my competition going on with my art. Second bonus. Operation Judgment as Imagined. And I wanted to put this forward to you. I've been doing some testing and some working around on this one, so it's an assessment based on a few things. Most, uh, uh, some... Analysis done at the time, but some analysis is based on some computer simulations and limitation simulations I've done using variations on Harpoon, etc. Well, a friend has been doing for me on variations of a Harpoon. The reality, as I pointed out, is 21 swordfish, 15 full Mars, and two sea, uh, two sea gladiators. She technically has 24, but three don't get available. So that's her, her, her air group when she's deployed. And this is that's achieved. The ten attacks, and this is what happens. You've got one hit on the Comte de Cavour, the one hit, uh, two, uh, no hits on the Andrea Doria, despite two attempts, one hit on the Dulio, Vittorio, three hit, uh, hits for four, Vittorio Veneto, no hits, two attempts, and no attempts on Gilio Sozio. Gilio Sozio. And the old tanks were put on fire by dive point. But let's see if Eagle was available. Not Ark Royal, Eagle. You then would have 18 swordfish on each of the two vessels. And you would have 15 full Mars and 7 sea gladiators. So this is based on each having their full air groups. The attack group would be comprised of 36 swordfish and 9 full Mars. Now, you're going to say, oh, hang on, no full Mars were sent in the first one, so why would they send full Mars in this one? In this point, you have one carrier, so one flight deck available, and you have this many aircraft. If you look at it, if you have two flight decks, and you have seven sea gladiators available and 15 full Mars. Sending nine full Mars as part of the attack group when you've got that many more air swordfish to go makes sense. It also gives you options, and it was part of some of the planning considered. Now, the 36 sword, full, sword fash, uh, swordfish and nine full Mars, um, so strike is probably three waves of eight torpedo armed swordfish and four swordfish and three full Mars armed with flares and bombs in each wave. So each wave is roughly 15 aircraft, with the full Mars taking on the flare roll, and probably doing that quite successfully, and the swordfish taking on doing carrying out the bombing roll again. So it's really not much of a change from what's actually conducted if you consider how the numbers work out in the first wave, in the, in the first wave and in the second wave, in terms of their attack groups. And I haven't factored in for aircraft going wrong because, well, it's one out of 21 has to withdraw. I'm thinking without the pressure of the aircraft having me moved around and all the other stuff that goes on, they might not even lose the one out of 21. 
stats, so I've left it all as all 24. And the stats work out at this. Conte de Cavour, 2 for 2. Andre Doria, 1 for 4. Dulio hit 2 for 2. Littorio hit 6 of 9. So, I'm sorry, I doubt Littorio is coming back into service. Conte de Cavour and Dulio, possibly. But two torpedo hits are not good. Vittorio Vinicius. Hello, and welcome to, well, as it says, Operation MB8, Taranto's big picture, because it's more than just sinking battleships. And, well, I would like to say I'm presenting this today, but um, honestly, someone else has decided that they are front and center. <laughs> So, welcome to Operation MB8 with the Fluffy Research Assistant. This is going to be harder on me than any of you because I'm getting squashed. <sighs> ah, well, it's some naval history fun. Right. Oh. So, as I've said several times, currently there is a family bet, a bragging rights bet going, which also involves potentially a picture. Thanks, I started by my spreadshirt saw, in that my aunt has bet me that if I get to 13,000 subscribers by December 31st, 2021, she and my uncle will take a photo of themselves wearing Blackburn, Blackburn face masks, so that thing, um, and I'll be able to post it on here. So, for that to happen, I need your help. If you can, that'd be great. If you don't, it all depends on whether you like the videos, I suppose, and I hope you do like them. As said, we have been joined by a fluffy research assistant who is wearing their cardigan because apparently, despite having a radiator on in here, it's cold. So, in quick, what are we talking about? Well, we have all these operations going on in November 1940. Remember, Italy joins World War II on the 10th of June 1940. So up until June 1940, it had literally been Germany. That had been the people they were fighting, the people on the Axis side. No one else had joined in. When Italy joins on the 10th of June 1940, the Royal Navy has to quickly reconfigure to fight in the Mediterranean as well as the North Atlantic. And Remember, because they've been fighting just in the North Atlantic, they had pulled back certain things. They had pulled back some destroyers, and they pulled back some other units from the Mediterranean to the North Atlantic to help the home fleet. The justification of building a huge new flotilla of escorts, and also the fact that a war versus Germany is going to be over so quickly, you'd never get a new capital ship built in time, so you might as well concentrate the yards on repairing the ones you do have and maintain them in service. Um, if you had Italy involved from the beginning, that would have been different. And as you can see from this list, these are some of the operations which are going ahead as planned. Now, there's AN6, there's MW3, there's Operation Coat, there's Operation Crack, there's o Convoy ME3, and there's Operation Judgment, which includes the attack of on Taranto, but also the Battle of Taranto Strait. Yay! This is the point. We think, talk about November, and we're getting to that point, so this comes out on the 2nd of November, and it's from two day, it's starting in two days' time. You are talking about a myriad of operations going on, and these are just the ones given names and form. I know, you want back up on the lap because you think you should be in the centre. I do know that. I do know. Now, they are a whole range of things going on, but you have to remember... Stop detracting, please. You have to remember that the actual attack itself, Taranto, and like the Operation Crack, which is an attack carried out by HMS Ark Royal, are actually covers. And they're covers for arguably one of the most important operations taken on in 1940. And that operation is the passing of reinforcements from one side of the Mediterranean to the other. 